Well, thank you very much for that lovely warm welcome. Uh, I guess literally. Um, it, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here today, to meet you, and I look forward to getting to know you better after a brief um, introduction. <coughs> Let me say that um, Venice always intrigued me from the first day that as a, as a graduate student I walked, I came to the city, I came like Catherine Hepburn in that movie, I came by train uh, alone, and I walked through the door and suddenly uh, I was in this I don't know what, how to characterize it, it's unique, in this fantasy world, dream world. So um, when I, <coughs> at some point in my life, uh, prior to my PhD orals, comprehensives, I had picked up a book that was a Hebrew translation of an Italian work written in 1638. And um, I, it was intriguing, but I felt that the introduction wasn't really very adequate because it didn't describe the book, it rather summarized the book, and, and that was it. So I thought to myself, is there any way that we can get into this and sort of get, dig deeper into what is being described in the book rather than paraphrasing it? So I discovered that there was a very large archive known as the Archivio di Stato di Venezia in Venice, one of the Europe's larger, largest, if you want, I'm not sure, archives and that they had records that I realized rather soon were more than one person could manage in their lifetime, especially if they had to commute to Venice from the United States, which I was not in a position to do. Uh, so um, what interested me, especially about Venice, reading the very little written then, and I t mention this especially for uh, the younger members of our group, it is unbelievable how scholarship in certain areas, and one of them is Jewish history, um, ha has, how tremendously it has developed in the last 30 or 40 years. If you look at the papers of my good friend Bernie Cooperman last week, uh, Kenny Stowe for next week, I haven't seen his paper yet, my own, you'll see that most of the literature, with the exception of a few classics that have either stood the test of time or have not stood the test of time and therefore should be mentioned in order uh, to use them as historiographical models of what people used to think. It's amazing how much research that has to be done. Um, looking at everything um, that had been written, what to me seemed one of the most interesting things as a Jewish historian was the tension between, on the one hand, the religiously motivated and I should also say economically motivated uh, dislike of the Jews and the eventual not only acceptance of them but even inviting them into the city of Venice. <coughs> uh, I should hasten to, uh, to add that the reason for uh, the dislike of the Jews economically was very, very basically not vague generalities about competition and this and that, but in the case of Venice, Venice had a very exclusionary commercial policy vis-a-vis -vis the East, the Ottoman Empire. Trade with the Levant was restricted only to the two upper classes in Venice, cittadini and nobles, who amounted to roughly never more than 10% of the population. So they just didn't want Jewish merchants coming in because commerce with the East was basically a monopoly of a class. So this does not qualify as anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism. This is straight commercial policy, uh, protectionist economic policy vis-a-vis -vis Mediterranean maritime trade. So um, the change in, 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 in uh, the, the policy of the government towards the Jews seemed to me absolutely fascinating. And I realized as I got deeper into it that we have two realities here. One is a medieval reality of money lenders I'm sorry I can't digress more today and talk about Jewish money lending and its role. And the second was the new world of Mediterranean trade against the background of the consolidation of the Eastern Mediterranean in the hands of the Ottoman Empire and the consolidation of the West in the hands of uh, Spain, France, England, all emerging monarchies in the early 16th century and then later put in there also Holland uh, after it became 
independent, and of course Portugal is always in there with its active ports. <coughs> so in that world, the, Jew became, the Jews uh, came to play a significant, now notice, not predominant, but significant, disproportional. This is one problem. Very often we hear about the Jewish position, uh, I don't know, in Hollywood, in business, etc., whatever it is, and we hear the word dominant used, but I think a better word might be very often, very often disproportional. And there's a big difference between being more than 2% of the, of the population that one is in general in any <coughs> given area and really dominating in the sense of dominance. But that's not my main point today. Um, you know, just let me just throw off a few things here and there. So a lot of trade was now in the hands um, a lot of trade was in the hands of Jews, as Venice no longer automatically was the entrepot exchange point between the Ottoman Empire, Constantinople, the Balkans, uh, you know, use pre-Ottoman pre terminology, the former Byzantine Empire, and northern Central Europe. Uh, Venice, the goods were no longer coming automatically to Venice because the ships of many European nations that we mentioned could navigate into the Mediterranean. Venice wanted all the help it could get, and Jewish merchants, many of whom were of Spanish origin, uh, were useful, and therefore it gave them privileges. And we can trace here a very, very specific kind of mercantilist economic uh, acceptance of the presence of the Jews. Now, I deliberately avoid, avoided the word toleration, because I'm not sure what tolerate means. I, I used a couple of times the word tolerate, then is tolerant of the Jews, etc. And I suddenly realized, what does toleration mean? Toleration means I recognize you and accept you as my equal. Toleration means I tolerate your presence, but uh, you're really not equal. You have to be in the ghetto, wear a badge, be in an inferior position. So I now am very careful uh, not to use the word tolerate. Venice permitted the Jews to live or whatever. You know, the reality, yeah, and don't bother with tolerate it. It's only the presence. Um, so. What, what we have then is, um, is the new, uh, is, 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 this in a sense looks forward for the early modernists towards later events, and you may hear more about this uh, from Kenny Stowe. Kuplin basically alluded to it very little, right? but you know, what happens in, in, in Livorno, what happens later on in Trieste, what's going to happen in uh, places like Marseille, Bordeaux, uh, Amsterdam, London, etc. You know, we're on the road here to mercantilist readmission and toleration of the presence, etc. So Venice is a fascinating place to study. But above all, the elephant in the room, if I may use that expression, is we have an institution known as the ghetto. The ghetto was not my original focus. I knew it was there. Uh, but I, 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 my background is not in sociology, anthropology, and those disciplines, but in straight history. And uh, the ghetto appeared, you know, along the way when it established important laws and that sort of thing. But then I realized <coughs> that I really should tease out the theme of the ghetto and handle it on its own. And this I did um, on a much wider scale because I taught general courses in Jewish history, so medieval, early modern, modern, and obviously, we're dealing there with ghettos being set up in various places. And one just has to read the newspaper to hear references to ghettos in uh, even looking at the excellent program here. The word is being used in connection with South Africa. The word is being used in connection with the United States, the Holocaust, and anywhere else in the world where the individual using the word thinks that he has a phenomenon that he can give the name ghetto to. And this, I realized, was creating so much misunderstanding. And the significance of the ghetto of Venice and of the early modern Italian ghetto was being lost in this shuffle of different things being called a ghetto. You might as well uh, use a word like a fruit or a, a housing area or something. It became so meaningless. So I wanted to sort of tease out and show how a word took on different meanings to sort of unpeel, or rather than unpeel, let's say add to the pile 
the reverse of archaeology, uh, to add the various meanings of ghetto that came along. And the confusion this takes if we don't hear what a ghetto really specifically is. So um, I, I really welcome the invitation to come here today because I, I thought that I could sort of give a slightly more general introduction on the what went on in Italy and then go on to trace briefly the development of the world and its diffusion. I'm very glad that uh, my old friend and colleague Bernie did this somewhat in his paper uh, as he traced things that were beyond the Italian peninsula. And I took that a little further, uh, going down uh, literally, <coughs> literally um, to the present. And I referred in the notes to two articles. Uh, that really, in a sense, you'll find there much of what I'm saying today, but not all. Uh, I have to condense a lot today in two articles, um, plus the reality and myth part. Now, there, I thought things over at length, and I must confess I wasn't sure. Do I begin with the reality and then go on to the myths, or maybe should I reverse it and put the myths at the end? After we've seen what the reality was, then I think we can better appreciate the myths because we have to know what the reality is. Uh, and the danger, of course, is to pull out what I already said and just stick it in a repeated conclusion. Um, I'm not sure if I made the right decision. I don't know. Um, I, you know, at the last minute, you know, had I called in uh, to your wonderful, wonderful, efficient Kari sitting here and suggested to her, look, can you redo it? I'm sending you a fabescent version. <laughs> stick those myths in at the beginning and, um, you know, uh, I'll decide maybe uh, towards the end of my 20 minutes here whether to pull the pages at the end and uh, <laughs> because you've already heard it. I really don't know. So, you know, take it both ways. But the point is that, um, that uh, if we reverse them, we see what the myths are. And I think that basically the problem is that the word ghetto can be like a Rorschach um, blot. I don't know if we still use these in psychology today. Yes, no. Psychologists, we still use those things and you have to read into what you see there and you know, whatever your phobias or loves are, you see it in that lot. So, you know, I think really that's what Darden is saying in his introduction that you see there the opening quote. The word concepts of the ghetto have attained such a degree of heterogeneity that it is difficult to determine whether any one of the resulting definitions or even a group of definitions affords an adequate description. Preliminary views of the ghetto, the preliminary views of ghetto definitions reveal that the ghetto is probably the most misused and the most understood spatial concepts used by social scientists. Our time here is really too brief for me to, uh, you know, play the old game, take out a piece of paper, write down what you thought <coughs> the, the ghetto was before uh, the first lecture of Professor Kufelman, and uh, then uh, you know, try to come up with your own definition and your own concept of ghetto at the end of uh, the seminar, whatever that comes in May or June or whatever, probably May. Um, I, I really, I really, I really don't know. Um, I really don't know. Um, I don't know what's going to be. I do suggest, however, one definition, and I realize it's open to criticism, but I go by the first place ever known as a ghetto. If that was the first place ever known as a ghetto, as Ruben Bonfield said, uh, Venice retains the copyright for the Felicitas, uh, whatever the, the quote was exactly, I use the word ghetto. So let's see what the original ghetto was. And the original ghetto, clearly the original characteristic was that it was, it was a place compulsory segregated and enclosed. And that meets basically Bernie Cooperman's definition halfway. Bernie said uh, any place um, established by law, okay, that's the basic essence, but you know, I'll just refine it a little bit specifically as I did, uh, as compulsory, segregated, and enclosed. Those of you who uh, remember the old days, just think of this old CSX railroad, which probably ran through Pittsburgh, did it? Yes, no, yes, 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 it did. So that, that Chesapeake and Ohio became, you know, CSX became uh, the symbol. And um, 
that 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 um, that um, will is an easy way to remember. The rabbis liked uh, to give always mnemonic uh, shortcuts for remembering words by taking the initials, uh, the Rashi Tevot, and make it easier to remember, as we do also here in the States. So let me give you a secular one to remember. Compulsory, segregated, enclosed. So I personally am taking the liberty of defining that as the essence of the ghetto. Now, it is true that the word takes on other meanings. That's fine. And I accept the fact that words develop. The only problem is that I think we have uh, a major, major communication issue if the word takes on differing meanings, if not even contradictory meanings. And these contradictory meaning, meanings are all floating around in the air. And we don't know exactly what's being meant. You know, another one, uh, example of um, lack of clarity in communication uh, that I often point out in my undergraduate teaching, forgive the digression, was very often we hear the words, for example, um, Muslim and Arab used indistinguishedly. An Arab is whatever it is, um, we, we, whatever it is, clearly Islam is a religion that anybody can join into. So either you are a Muslim, or you are not, either you are a Muslim or you are something else. If you are an Arab, that basically is a, I, I can't use the word racial, uh, I, I, I can't, ethnic, whatever, but you all know what I mean. The, the point is these words are used much, much too interchangeably in everyday parlance one doesn't often, one often catches a mistake. The same is true with the word ghetto. It's one of those words commonly in use. And uh, the question is, when the user uses it, what is he referring to? Is he talking about a place that is, by law, segregated, compulsory, segregated, and enclosed? Or is he talking by a pl about a place which does not make it more morally justified? Let's get that across. We are not discussing anything here um, on that level, it does not justify anything that has been called a ghetto. The only problem is we are talking about equal levels, equal types of unjust situation that should not exist in a free liberal society. But there are different levels and different reasons for uh, the injustices that have occurred in this world. And I think it's important for us as we go on to study things to realize that there can be different reasons for uh, the situation. And here, um, here um, I would suggest, and I really want very carefully to limit myself only to Jewish history, because this is the only area that I have the academic competence to stand up and talk about. Many of you here know, have forgotten more in certain areas on your program here than I ever knew. And you know, I stand here humbly, aware of the fact that um, I don't know much, and I look forward to reading other papers uh, that will be presented, especially on South Africa, and um, you know, similarly on the United States. Uh, again, my major was not contemporary sociology or anything, and I'm sure I learned a lot. Um, the Holocaust, well, maybe that's one area that I should return to for a minute. And here I think we have to draw a very important difference between anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. One of the main forces in, um, in the dislike of the Jews was, anti, was religious. Now you can adduce other things, and very often the, the issue is that once a, Jew, a group is seen as being different, is disliked, then all sorts of other negative stereotypes and untrue things are attributed to that group. So again, sticking to Jews, the basic problem, as I said, was not on the popular level, the one line in one gospel that the Jews uh, basically told Apartheid's Pilate to spare the, uh, the criminal rather than uh, Jesus. The issue was, as I pointed out, theological. I, I don't want to go over it again. I can't spend more time on it, but the problem is we have a situation where we have two religions and they are competing for validation. Jews claim a long tradition based upon the Bible, uh, the prophets, the rabbis, and their interpretations. The Christians uh, agree with the, the Bible as being the source of authority, but they interpret it differently. 
and they then uh, trace their background, their 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 legitimacy from the Bible through Jesus, uh, the apostles, and so on. So we have two competing views built around, based upon the same text, and that leads to the demand for the Jews to be uh, marked as being inferior because God rejected them, and since God rejected them, they have to be inferior. And this, I think, anti-religious uh, <coughs> element has to be very carefully understood when we look at the ghetto. The, uh, now, I don't believe that everybody who has said something in the name of religion was necessarily a deeply religious soul. I'm not that naive. I realize that religion can be a justification for all sorts of evils, fill in your own blank, and vis-a-vis whatever area you're in, I'm sure you have blanks to fill in there. But rather, we should not automatically be cynical and try to reduce religious statements to uh, purely um, psychological uh, factors or purely, uh, purely, purely, more importantly, um, to really covers up for uh, exploitation, for um, conquest, etc. People really did believe, we may consider that, whatever we think, people genuinely did believe more than they did today. The concept of the um, century of belief or the world of belief of pre-modern times may be exaggerated, but don't go 100% the other way. People really believed, and they believed in a God, a God who created the world, a God who ruled the world, uh, if you wish even predestination, you name it, determinism uh, sometimes, and the Jews were really rejected by God. Christianity was the true religion. Therefore, keep away from the Jews. Do not, uh, do not mix with them. Do not associate them. And once again here, um, I leave it to others to develop it further. But one thing that the Catholic Church, uh, the, the Christian Church, uh, strictly forbade was intercourse relationships, sexual relationships, especially between Jewish men and Christian women. And um, you know, this reminds us of certain other uh, countries and societies, I think on your agenda, <coughs> that had similar laws. Taken the German term Rassenschande, religious shame, race shame, uh, I don't know if anyone el- ever used it or invented it. I should look for it and that universal source of knowledge today online and see whether anybody beat me to it. If not, you know, just let me copyright it uh, to the effect, to the effect of, re- uh, pardon my accent, uh, this is meant to be German, uh, religion shanda, religion shanda, a disgrace of religion. So against this background, we see then early on that Jews and Christians ought to be separated and um, obviously the ultimate, the Jews have to be marked by a distinguishing sign and so on. And ultimately, the key factor here in distinguishing, separating the Jews, limiting contact is the institution of the ghetto. And therefore, I point out that um, we have to view the ghetto, the institution of the ghetto, primarily in, in religious terms. Now, um, it is true that there, were, there could be economic competition between Jewish and Christian merchants and the like, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but um, the ghetto are primarily the reason for establishing it is religious separation. Uh, in some places, Venice is one of them, uh, the Jews especially, were especially later on invited in to help the economy. Jewish moneylenders, and I regret I can't develop this theme more, Jewish moneylenders really fulfilled a vital need. Credit wasn't there. Some of them had some money available. They were allowed to do it legally. Christians were legally not allowed to do it, although many did. And this led to the Jews having a legal monopoly. Legal Christians lent money illegally, of course. The Fuggers, who indirectly touched off the Reformation, and others had a major share in money lending, but the Jews could do it legally, hanging out their shingle, and, um, and um, therefore this enabled them to stay in business because the state wanted them there as money lenders, the state controlled them, uh, their interest rates and the like. <coughs> the Merchant of Venice is, a spe- let me toss off one more myth. This is not history. This is Shakespeare's conception of probably what went on, and, and 
I'm willing to stick my neck out and say that, that the, uh, the, the Merchant of Venice was not primarily an anti-Jewish play. Shylock has a few good universalist lines, nothing like it until the Enlightenment, uh, Mendelssohn, Lessing the Wise, uh, Lessing, Mendel, I'm sorry, Lessing, Nathan the Wise, and Mendelssohn. Uh, Shylock has a few good lines. Shylock is not living in a ghetto. Shylock is not, which Venice had at the time. Um, Venice, uh, Sh Shylock is not wearing a yellow badge. And, um, and also, any Venetian court would have thrown both of them out for making foolish bets, uh, arrangements regarding a pound of flesh, uh, would have thrown them out or sent them both to the, um, to the, um, to the lunatic asylum. But Shylock is, unfortunately, the dominant uh, figure, the dominant symbol of Jewish money lending. Uh, but the state basically encouraged Jewish money lending as a means of uh, promoting welfare. Anything beyond that statement gets us into local differences in welfare of whom. So the key thing is that um, we, we, we always have, we, we always have uh, we, always, we have then anti-Judaism. Now, anti-Judaism can be very, very easily ended. All a Jew has to do is convert. All a Jew has to do is walk into a church, find the padre, and say, please, here I am. The father, uh, the friar, the bishop, the monk, uh, converts the Jew according to a set formula. That person is now forever Christian. So uh, this was a way out. But Jews were taught that they really were the chosen uh, element, the chosen people, that Judaism was valid, and they should wait patiently for their Messiah. So not that many Jews converted. Some did out of conviction, <coughs> some did for love, some did for money, some did out of force. But the point is, theoretically, a Jew could convert. Now, when we get down to the 19th century, we have new ideas. The word Semitism didn't, didn't exist previously. The word Semitism now, um, refers initially to languages, then it gets transferred to groups of people, then it becomes into a high, is organized in a hierarchy, and at this, and at, and at this point, thanks, and at this point, um, we begin with a hierarchy uh, with the Semites at the bottom, and we have hi hierarchy in the Semites, and the Jews are the lowest of that lot. Now, if you are born genetically a Semite, you cannot convert out of your Semitism, right? Uh, so, so the view then is that Semitism is something racial, or if you want, genetic, and the only way to avoid it is to have three, well, if you have, or four Jew, non-Jewish grandparents. So there is no exit. So the charge that the Holocaust was a return to the Middle Ages is something for which um, the Holocaust should hire a an expensive, capable uh, defense lawyer get it off the hook because in the Holocaust there was no exit whatsoever. Earlier in this world there was. Any Jew could leave a ghetto in Venice, in Rome, uh, in Florence, in Frankfurt, you name it, walk out, go to the cathedral, go to a priest, convert. There would be problems of inheritance between his children. Uh, you know, there were problems, okay, but you could do it. The Holocaust at the end is no exit, basically. A Jew could not go to the SS and say, look, I want to convert, let me out, no dice. So this is the end of the ghetto. And too many of the myths of the ghetto are built around events <coughs> after the Italian period. And this is what I want to leave you with. And then I look forward keenly to your questions that will open me up to new ideas coming from completely different perspectives. What we have then is an institution uh, a, a word, a name. For most of us, the image will be that of either, either Warsaw, Bialystok, uh, other places that literally were, were concentration camps and not ghettos, but let that go. Uh, places like Bergen-Belsen and elsewhere, an extermination camp and a concentration camp were two different things. Let's see that for the people talking about the Holocaust. Um, the, also, 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 of course, when they think of Situations, ghettos such as Harlem, uh, such as Watts, such as elsewhere, one may use the term for South Africa, elsewhere, one may use the term for concentrated quarters of any group, Jews or not. 
And I submit to you that what we have to do is, in our mind and in history, sort out what's going on. Now, all I can say is that I realize words can change, but if they are hindering communication, maybe we should think things over twice, and therefore, think over twice what you are you mean when you refer to a ghetto, what you think your readers, are, if you're lecturing as a professor, teacher, what you think your students will imagine, what do you think, um, what do you think your readers will think if you're writing it, and um, take uh, and really, um, really take it from there. So what I try to do is give you the Italian background in which the word merged, the <coughs> definition based upon that original Italian background, the, trend, the history of the word, some references to some institutions, and if you want to pursue this further, you know, if you're looking for a doctoral um, dissertation topic or anything else, et cetera, et cetera, you know, give it a thought to trying to untangle this situation in any area that you feel at home in. You, there may be linguistic problems with certain areas, but, uh, you know, and if you feel the sociology, if you have the tools of sociology, anthropology, uh, Professor Kuplin stressed quite a bit urban, urban planning and the like, uh, Stowe will give you further ideas. You know, just think it over and figure it out. And the main thing is, you know, just keep thinking and realize twice and draw up a list of other words that can be used so ambiguously in everyday parlance in the newspapers and in television. Thanks. Right.